Good morning, everyone. We're going to start off with a prayer. Father, we thank you for your providence. We thank you for all the might you've given us to endure this walk. We ask for continued revelation. We ask that you lead us in bringing people in here and going out to uh, do some door-to-door -door ministry or some street evangelism as it gets warmer this season. We'd like to go out into the town and We'd like you to guide us to the people that you want to come here that need help. We just want you to use this place. We want you to use all of us, Lord. That's what we're here for. That's our purpose on this earth. And we thank you for creating us with that intent that you preordained our works before the foundation of the world. And we love you and we praise your name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to do another group deliverance on April 20th to 21. Uh, we'll have a bunch of people come out those dates, and then we will have some food, and we'll do baptisms just like last time, have some fellowship, and uh, we'll get people what they need that weekend. So again, that's April 20th to the, to the 21st. That's a Saturday and a Sunday. So again, everyone can email visitbds at gmail.com and let me know if you want to come out. You have to get a hotel unless we arranged otherwise. So that'll be that. Other than that, I'm going to call this sermon, How to Starve Evil Spirits Out of the Flesh. I want to do a teaching on this because on the internet there's a lot of teachings on how to starve out evil spirits and most of them are simply involving fasting and that's just one limited aspect of starving demons out of your flesh. If you go online people will complain, oh I can't get a demon out, I can't get a demon out, everyone's got the same answer, you fast. You fast, you fast, you fast, and that's not always going to get it done. It will get it done sometimes, but, you know, fasting needs to be done with discernment. You need to be in good health before you start fasting. A lot of people that are first coming to Christ want to get uh, delivered right away, and they think if they fast, that's going to just fix all the problems, but they're already malnourished. They've already been eating McDonald's for the last 20 years. And it's better to get your body healthy before you start starving yourself so you don't mess up your immune system and other things, your gut microbiome. You have to make sure that your gut is healthy because if you have a bunch of bad bacteria in your gut and candida and you starve yourself, it's going to really overtake your system. Um, that happened to me. I went from being... Uh, a drug addict that eats Ben and Jerry's ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to not eating anything. So anyone who's thinking about fasting to get demons out, you might want to email me and get some advice on when you should be doing that if you've been living an unhealthy lifestyle and how to break those fasts. But um, that's all I'm going to say about fasting in this. This is not going to be about fasting. This is going to be about everything else that's not fasting because everyone else tells you to fast. So we're going to talk about what demons love and we're going to talk about what demons hate. Because if you want to starve demons out of your flesh, you have to know what demons love and what demons hate. And then you're going to make that vessel, you're going to make their living space a space that they don't want to live in by taking away what they love and then you're going to do what they hate all at the same time. Uh, you're going to do this while you're seeking God, of course. You're going to do this by the blood of Jesus Christ, of course. But long story short, if they're getting what they want, if they're getting fed, they're not going to go away. If you throw tuna fish outside your front door every night, eventually some stray cats are going to show up. And if you keep throwing food out the door, the cats are never going to leave. They're going to come by every night looking to eat, and demons are the same way. Demons want fuel 
They want lust fuel. They want sin fuel. And that's how they thrive in a person's body. They're looking to have fun just like you are. They want to have a good day and get what they want just like human beings. Okay? So what do they love? Demons love attention. This is one thing they love more than anything. They like when the spotlight's on them. You'll see people who find out they have demons talking to their demons all day, verbally, and going back and forth in fruitless conversations with demons. They will never leave if they're getting that kind of attention from people. So if you want to starve them out, don't sit there and have a chit-chat with them. Quietly and seriously rebuke them and resist them and don't engage them. Now, Another kind of attention they like is when you talk about them from a perspective that they're unbeatable, which is something like this. People come in here and do it sometimes. They'll come in and say, oh, my demons are so strong, it's going to take 10 hours to get them out. Or I'm going to have to come back here 10 times to uh, fix my demon problem. Now, they made up God's mind for them already. They might get delivered in five minutes and be gone, or it may take a long time. But the point is, when they are making that decision beforehand, you always know their demons have convinced them that they're so powerful that no man of God could deal with them, or, you know, God's not strong enough to get it done. And when you talk about them in that light, they love it and they never leave. Especially when you go Christian to Christian and you glorify the devil. Oh, my demons are so strong. Oh, my demons will never come out. The demons will never come out if that's what you believe. You need to believe God is able to perform what he promised or they will not come out. That's scriptural. God can perform what he promised at any moment. Really, anyone who has demons... It's your fault almost all the time if you have demons. You can never really blame the minister because if you resisted them hard enough, they would come out anyway. So the, the, the onus is primarily on you to get them out, not the man of God you're going to see. So when you're walking around and talking about how strong your demons are, in other words, you're saying, I'm weak. I'm a, I'm a bad Christian. I don't follow Christ right. You're saying the same thing to a minister with discernment. He's going to say, oh, well, I guess you don't follow Christ right if your demons are so strong. Because I know when people go to pray for me, I'll manifest in three seconds. Once, you know, I'm fighting those demons so hard that once I actually sit down for prayer, all someone has to do is say, Father, and I'm yawning, yawning, coughing. <coughs> Instantly, because they're already constantly resisted. You know what I mean? Now, in the beginning, that's tormenting because so many of them have to come out. Thank God I'm not in that phase anymore. Now I'm hitting them in pockets when they're, you know, when the strong one's ready to come out. But you need to be, you need to put all the blame on yourself when they're not coming out. You're not hating your sin enough. You're not taking it seriously enough. You're not loving God enough. Something's wrong if they're not coming out. You want to do something to get them moving, right? You want to do something to... If, if what you're doing isn't working, you need to try something else. They say the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If you want a different result, you have to put a different stress on those demons, some demons will, will break under one kind of stress, and others will break under another kind of stress. Some will break just by forgiving people. Others will break just by forsaking lusts. And no, no two demons are the same like no two people are the same. Demons love to be feared and instill fear. So if you allow them to instill fear in you, they're not going anywhere. This is one of their favorite things to do. They'll, especially when people first come to Christ and they learn about demons and they think there's a demon in the corner or they're looking into the shadows or they feel a little thing or a little twitch or something. Sometimes demons will poke you in the stomach and, and then put a thought in your head that you got 
cancer or something, or they'll poke you in the chest, and you'll feel a sharp pain shooting up through there, and, you, and then they'll shoot the idea into your head, oh, you're having a heart attack, and you'll start to get anxious, and then they'll do it again three hours later and put the same thought in, and as you keep buying that thought, eventually you become a hypochondriac. As you keep believing the lie and not trusting God, they have little sneaky ways of, of, of eroding your mental capacities and eroding your sound mind and making you parano paranoid, right? So you have to be very careful about that because it starts slowly and it gets worse and worse as you give yourself over to it. When I first came to Christ, they were moving objects around. And I was so fascinated that they were moving things around that I would sit in my house at 2, 3 in the morning on a quiet, dark night, looking at the table where they're moving stuff and just staring at it and just sitting there in silence, looking in the corner, waiting for a chair to move, waiting for a shadow to move across the room, just fascinated and it made it worse. It made it worse because I was focusing on them and I was giving them the stage. Instead of putting on an audio Bible and meditating on God and doing it that way. Um, I was like that because I was doing occultic things and for a while I thought that that meant what I was doing was working. And in a way it kind of did mean it was working because the demons were coming in. But when you give them that attention they love it. And it got worse and worse and worse, and it got to the point where they would come into the house so powerful, all the light bulbs would blow out in a row, and the, dog, the hair on my dog's back would stand up. And after all those light bulbs would blow out, whichever direction the bulbs blew toward in the house, the dog would turn to that direction. His hair would stand up, and he'd be snarling. And he never does that. Snarling like a bear in the wilderness, you know what I mean, at, at this devil that just came in. And the dogs can see them. When they manifest into the room powerfully, the animals in your house will be able to sense that they're there even better than you can. You know what I mean? Next. Demons love to be entangled with the affairs of this world. So if you disconnect yourself from the world, you're going to starve those demons out. On the internet... In other people's matters, if you're a busybody in other people's business, they won't go anywhere. You know, everybody gets convicted when they're dabbling with something online or gossiping or doing something like that by God when they're not supposed to be doing that. And many people don't stop it. They just do it anyway. They don't actually heed the conviction and stop what they're doing. And if you don't heed that conviction, they will never come out. And you'll notice when you start to heed that conviction, they will come out immediately. And if they don't come out immediately, it may take a couple times doing it, but it will seem immediately. Because you've now changed the way, the, the stress that you're putting on them. You've adopted a new habit. Anytime you adopt a new habit, you're changing the atmosphere for the demons and some will have to leave. And that's very important for you to understand. Demons love when you believe their lies. Lies would be, you're not suitable for ministry. Well, sometimes you're not suitable for certain ministries, but they'll tell you you're not suitable for any ministry. God can't use you at all, right? And that's not true. God has an office for every one of his children. So there's no such thing as God can't use you at all. That's a lie from the devil. If you believe it, then you believe their lie, and that kind of demon, that lying spirit, is never going to leave your life. How about you'll never meet a wife, or you'll never meet a husband like that? If you believe that lie... That devil will never leave your life. After you meet a wife and after you meet a husband, if you're afraid that they'll leave you and you live in fear, that devil will never leave your life. Whatever lie they sold you, 
The second you buy it, it's enough to keep them there. And I believe there's, a, there's, there's always a, a lot of them doing different things. So you need to watch out for all different kinds of lies. Um, my kids are going to get sick and die. I'm going to get sick and die. I'm going to go broke like that. Is this thing making noise? It's rubbing a little bit. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Next, demons love to run in packs. And what they do is, if they don't have a good pack of demons where they can take people down, the devil will send other human beings into your life that have those demons in their body. So if things are going good in your world and you're, and you're being effective for God, what happens is someone else will just randomly show up in your life and you'll be like, and, and they'll and they'll persistently try to insert themselves into your life. And you need to be very careful of this. When someone's pushy about about just jamming themselves into your life scenarios, you can almost be certain that Satan had sent that person because the demonic atmosphere in that person's soul is perfectly designed to ruin your life and your family's life. So we need to be very careful about that with our families and with our church and everything, right? Another thing demons love is when you don't know that they're persons, that you don't know that they're actual, true, demonic entities that have personalities like you and I. They love when you don't know that, because you, you won't resist them as much if you don't know that they're actually people in you trying to destroy you. And when I say people, I don't mean human people. I mean spiritual people. Now, you have to imagine it like this. What would you be doing if you were a demon living in their body and you had the power to speak into their mind? You need to put yourself in their shoes and say, what would they be doing? What would they really be doing if they wanted to destroy my life? And that's going to help you figure out what they're doing, and that's going to motivate you to resist them like you're in a war, rather than you just think it's you. Because if you don't think they're people that are spiritual people with personalities, then you are going to never fight them properly. Because you're always going to say, oh, that's just my personality. Demons are disembodied persons. Their personalities are so unique. Just like every person we meet has a unique personality, I mean, everyone we meet is very, very different. Some people are angry people. Some people are bitter people. Some people are shy people. Some people are murderous people. Some people are deceitful people. They all have different personalities. Demons love when you obey them. So if they send you to lust, if you lust, they're going to stay. If they send you to lie, if you lie, they're going to stay. If they make you lazy, they're going to stay. If they make you uh, a glutton, they're going to stay. If they make you anything, unemployed and you're okay with it, they're not going anywhere. They love depravity. So anywhere where someone's tormented or depraved, they're not going to go anywhere. So we have the choice to live how we want to live. We, you choose how you feel. It's just these demons get people so low and so down that they feel like there's no way out of it. It's all a lie. But at any point, in any time, you can just say, no, I'm not going to be depressed. I'm going to refuse to be depressed. I'm going to refuse to be bitter. I'm going to refuse to not forgive. And they will come out if you can do that, but you're going to fight them. Because the second you try to do that, they're going to meet you with all the resistance and all the might that they have. And at that point, you need to lean on God, and then you'll be delivered. Demons love to keep you from seeking the Lord. They love to keep you from praying. They love to keep you 
from seeking God or humbling yourself and asking God for help. It's very important that you do that. If you don't ask God for help, you're not going to overcome demons. And if you don't ask God to show you what your issues are, you're not going to overcome demons. It's impossible. There are some things only He could reveal to us. There's demons in people that they can't see. And we need to turn to the Lord and figure out what they are. The quicker you do it, the better it'll be, right? And the faster they'll come out. Demons love to build kingdoms in people. Okay, this happens when they keep convincing you to sin. They multiply themselves in you. That's why the demon said, I am legion, for we are many. As that guy's in the tombs, depressed, cutting himself, they're filling in, filling in, filling in. The goal is always to do what? Kill. The end goal is always to kill of the devil. To destroy and kill and murder and steal. But the end goal is always the death, right? So if he could get enough of his demons in a person, what are they going to be shooting for? Suicide, right? Or to get the person to overdose or go get into a gunfight. Something that's so violent and destructive, right? So we need to be very careful when we're dealing with the devil that we understand that they're building a kingdom. Now, that kingdom could be getting bigger or smaller. That depends on the way you're walking your walk out. There's been many times in my Christian walk where certain kingdoms in me, I believe, were actually getting bigger, even though I was following Jesus Christ, because I was ignoring that kingdom. I was focusing on five other kingdoms, maybe ten, and they were depleting. But in certain areas where I was blind... It was getting worse and worse and worse. And, and usually God will show you in that time when it's getting worse, and then you'll be able to address it. And then you know when things get so bad in that area, you got a long run to, to wear that kingdom back down. Now, that's why it's important we read the Word, and we're well-rounded in the Word. That's why in the last sermon that I preached, I talked about not breezing over any scriptures, because if you miss one family or group of scriptures and you're weak in that area, that is going to be where Satan exploits you in that area. And in just one area, if he gets you real bad in just one area for long enough, he can, he can destroy you with that one. You know what I mean? It only takes one mistake. It only takes one mistake to bring a ministry down. That's why you have to be on point at all times. Demons love to destroy people's lives. Demons love to separate friends. This is something we're going to see many times in this place. People are going to come in and they're going to say things and I'm immediately going to figure out if they're trying to drive a wedge between friends. And when I find out that they're trying to drive a wedge between friends, I'm not going to tell them, but I'm going to go tell everyone else, You're, this person's trying to drive a wedge between this ministry, trying to cause division. And by the time we actually throw you out, I'm going to let everybody watch you for three months do your job, but I'm going to make sure everybody knows what you're doing and no one's going to tell you. So don't ever come in here and try and divide this church because we are going to be talking about you and we're not going to tell you. And when it becomes so evident of what you're doing, we're all going to have a talk about it if you're doing it and say, did they tell you this? Did he tell you this about him? And we're going to catch you if you're a gossiper. The Bible says if you repeat a matter, you separate very friends. If you gossip and you tailbear and you do that stuff, that's one of the most destructive things to a church. And I want to make sure everyone here knows that it's easy to fall into it, and it's something demons love to do. And a demon, or multiple demons, will spend a lot of time to set that paradigm up where they could divide a church. And that's why I'm going to go around telling people about it beforehand if I see it on the first day. 
because I want people to learn what it looks like while it unfolds so they can watch it. So if one day I'm not here, they're experts at understanding what it is. If one day I'm long gone, I want my children to know how to spot uh, someone who splits churches. I want you guys to know, everybody, anyone running this church or that's going to this church needs to know how to spot people who split the church. It's going to be the Jezebel spirit almost all the time. And it's going to be a female most of the time. Not every time. But most of the time it's going to be a female. Demons love to steal hope. Jeremiah 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans to prosper you and not harm you. They are plans to give you hope and a future. So God has plans to give us hope, and the devil's always trying to steal that hope. Hope is the most powerful thing you could have in this walk. Because once your hope is gone, you're hopeless, literally. And you can't get anything done that way. It's a big problem. If you don't have hope, you don't have trust in God, you don't have faith in God, God won't honor your life. Because you got to believe that God could bring you out of any trouble. The Bible says he'll deliver us into seven, uh, six troubles and in seven we'll be set free. That's, that's faith that we need to have. Sometimes things are all going wrong all at once. Everything, the car is breaking down, you're sick, you lost your job. That's when your faith is being tested. Whenever that happens, your faith is being tested. So when the world is falling down on you, remember Job, how many things went wrong all at once? We know that that was a test. Satan approached God on him to test him. So in those moments, you need to never lose faith, never lose hope. Demons love people who don't take anything seriously. This is a struggle for everybody because it seems like a subtle sin. When you, t when you make a joke of everything, it's hard to get delivered because you're not taking anything seriously. When you have demons, which everyone does, as we believe, and you don't take that sin seriously and you don't take your deliverance seriously, you won't be delivered. And uh, years back, I used to crack jokes a lot. And one time someone was praying for me and a demon manifested. And that demon tried to make everyone in the room laugh and it worked. It definitely worked. And it didn't leave because of that. And then eventually somebody came along that was very serious that didn't find it funny. And walked right up to me and was, they were very serious and said, No demon, you're coming out. This is of the devil. And they weren't laughing. The demon was trying to make everyone laugh, and this one person wasn't laughing. That's the kind of person that I needed to get it out. Because the person that took it so seriously was able to move that demon because that demon hated that person. Demons hate people that have the opposite characteristics as them. That's why sometimes one person will cast demons out of you, but another person can't. Because one person might have a lot of pride, one might have a lot of lust. If you got a lot of lust, you can't cast out lust. Jesus said you got to pull the beam out of your own eye before you can cast a splinter out of someone else's eye. Right? It's very important. And he also said, judge not lest you be judged, for the measure you meet will be met unto you. So if you're coming up to someone and saying, come out lust, that spirit might just multiply itself and, and, and come into you and stay in the other person. I believe they can do that. I have no biblical backing for that. But I believe that's possible. Because lust is, lust is a spirit. It's not, it's, it's not something that occupies a fixed space all at the same time. It takes to, it, Spirits can, can splinter themselves. It's just the way it works. That's why, again, we have that I and we in that story with Legion. How can Legion call himself I and we at the same time? Think about that. Demons love to steal your joy. 
Demons don't like a joyful person. They like someone that's always depressed, always gloomy. If someone's walking around all day singing songs to God and singing psalms and praising the Lord, that, for a lot of people, that will get them a lot of deliverance. If you're a real stiff-necked kind of person, a real nasty kind of person, just you walking around telling people I love you and singing songs will get a lot of demons out of you. Because demons hate love. I used to be like that, especially before I was born again. Even with my girlfriends and stuff like that, they would say, you're not affectionate. I'd be like, I know, I don't care. That's just the way I am. Don't you want to hold my hand? No, not really. I'm smoking a cigarette. Leave me alone. You know? But when I held their hand, I'd feel like, Ugh. Ugh. you know? But I didn't know the difference. I didn't know what it was then. You know what I mean? I didn't know what I was loaded with devils. So if I held their hand and I did something like affectionate or emotional, like, you know, or just showed a lot of like what I would call fruity kind of love back then, I would feel like my skin was crawling. Didn't know what it was. Then when I got married to my wife, what do you know? It happened again, but this time I knew what it was. And I was like, all I got to do is give my wife a hug and a kiss and tell her I love her and these demons are just going to come out. This is the best way to get deliverance. Because I don't really have to fight all day my lust or fight my anger tooth and nail. All I got to do is give my wife a kiss and tell her I love her. And some people never do that in a marriage. Some people go five years and never do that. And it's because of demons. Demons love to lust and consume everything. They like to lust over the, the human form. Hips, legs. and If you notice, uh, any, any man that ever walked the earth that's over 12 years old knows that it's a woman's form that turns your eye. When you, when, and that's because there's a spirit in there. They, they see the legs and the hips and the hair and all, and, and all that stuff. And they're attracted to it because the devil pounces on a human being like a cougar. That's how they come on people. Jesus Christ said Satan fell down like lightning. They come on, you know, the spirit will come on, enter somebody, or try and go into a woman or go, go somewhere they want to go. And they're attracted to the form. Not so much the face, but the whole the whole form, and they like to consume that form, and they like to consume food and lust and sex and everything, and their, their lust is insatiable. It never, it's never satisfied. Once they meet a certain degree, they need more, 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 more. So you know if you always, if you can't control yourself in any area, you need to resist those devils of lust, right? in any area in your life. And it could be with a lot of things. It could be with smoking, drinking, sex, food, money, right? Even fame, all kinds of different things. Pride, respect of men, the love, the, the love of attention, all of it. Now, what do demons hate? So we're going to make sure that we don't give them what they love. But now we're going to give them what they hate, right? They hate when you refuse to obey and you resist your flesh and you repent. That's why re repentance and resisting the flesh is throughout all our teachings because it's the foundational thing you need to do to deal with the devil. I'm not going to talk about it too much in this video because we've, we've covered it so many times. But The next thing they hate more than anything is when you unplug from the world. When you unplug from the world, the habitat becomes unbearable in someone's body for demons to live in. That goes for sports, television, goofing off with unbelievers, uh... Mingling with unsaved family, 
and you're more like them than they are like you. You're not taking a stance for Christ, but you're showing up to a family event and just goofing off with family. That alone will, will keep you in the world. You know what I mean? Um, the internet, all that kind of stuff, guys. Music, anything like that. Even certain pastors on the internet that are so-called Christian pastors are of the world and they're of the devil. Next, you recognize when you're being dragged into demonic thought patterns. So, if you constantly are angry, bitter, depressed, lazy, confused, if you constantly live in fear, recognize that's your pattern, that's your weakness. Don't remain in it. Learn to recognize it within a matter of seconds. So, you know, you don't sit there on the couch, think, you know, letting the devil drag you down this trail of depression for a half hour or an hour or the whole night or the whole day or the whole month. The weaker the Christian, the longer these demons drag them down. Suicidal people and people that are depressed, they've been getting dragged down for years. Satan's setting them up for a big fall. And, and that's why they end up killing themselves. These people that end up doing shootings or committing robberies and stuff, you know, when you're a thief, you sit around for a long time plotting those robberies. And I remember when I used to be a thief, I used to sit in my house. And the second the idea came into my head, I wouldn't go rob somebody. I would sit there for, for months. All right, I'm going to go in the back. I'm gonna, you know, No, if I go in the back, there might be a camera. I'm just going to knock the window out. When are they bringing construction supplies in? Is it time for them to put the electric wire in? I, mean, I need to wait another week. Because I, if I go in now, I won't be able to steal the electric wire, the copper pipe, and, and everything. I'll only be able to get half the stuff, so let me wait. I wouldn't just go and jump on it, I would sit there and premeditate it and allow those demons to build up in me where I have the, the plan and the boldness to now go in and do the evil. And it works the same way with depression, suicide, and everything. Even before I was born again, if I wanted to sleep with a woman, I'd be like, oh, at the, you know, there's prom weekend, or maybe, you know, when her boyfriend walks away, I'll walk up to her and say this. And it's all planned out. When you're working with demons, it's not just something that, that happens instantly. you got to give yourself over to that line of thinking to really uh, perpetrate that sin and be destroyed by the devil. And it's the same way with us Christians even today. Only it's not as extreme as robbing somebody blatantly and doing willful sin. It's... It's sin that no one could see, like unbelief, unforgiveness, depression, right? It's, it's an epidemic among Christians today. And if a Christian, if a Christian knew that they could stop their own depression just by resisting demons, none of them would be depressed. None of them would be depressed. None of them would be angry. None of them would be bitter. The next thing demons hate is they hate when you recognize that you're being dragged into their plan and you start to resist them. So that's what they hate the most, when you start to push back. This is going to be when most people start to manifest. The first time they push back, they'll feel uncomfortable or they'll feel like, whoa, this is, you know, I'm doing this, it's weird. And the second or third time, they might notice that demon's not happy. And sometimes you'll get anxiety at this point. When you push against these demons, you, your heart will start racing. I remember the first time I pushed against those demons uh, in a church. It wasn't the first time I pushed against them in general, but I got, I got a... A guidance from the Holy Spirit to get up and speak in the church or give my testimony and I also got a, guid a guidance one time to stand up in a drug and alcohol meeting because I was there with my friend 
and proclaim Christ to AA, you know? And I remember the second I thought about it, the demon told me in my mind, no, you can't do that here. Everyone's going to laugh at you. And I was like, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. All of a sudden, they know the thought. Just the thought is you beginning to resist them. Forget about standing up. When I stood up, it was like, you know? But that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to stop you from doing something for God. They're trying to keep you in a bad spot where you don't do anything. And we face it everywhere we go. We go to stores. Oh, should I tell this person about Christ? Should I preach here? And they're in there. It's just how great is that darkness? That's the question. You know the people that are really bold for Christ? They've worked on that kingdom. They might be weak in lust. They might stink in being gentle. They might be proud. It's like a lot of street preachers, right? They're proud. They have no love. Heidi. They're proud. They have no love. And uh, they can preach. They're not afraid to preach. Some people have no pride. Well, I won't say none. But some people have almost none. But they're afraid to preach. Why? It's because whatever kingdom you work on, that's the one you're going to be strong in. And anywhere you're blind, that's where you're going to be weak in. Demons hate when you seek peace with all men. Because when you seek peace with all men, they can't spring up resentment in you. That's one thing they do all the time to Christians. It's something, that's, that's just like a baseline trick they're always doing, no matter how long you've been a Christian. Someone does something to you, why'd they do that? Making you mad. That's always going to be. But as you, be, as you grow in Christ, you're going to get better and better at stopping that quickly and shutting it down and moving on. And you'll, that'll change your whole life if you do that better, right? If you don't hold resentment or anger. But if you want to walk around your job and say, why didn't that guy bail that thing right? Or that guy, every time he drives by with the forklift, gives me a dirty look that I want to punch him in the face, you know? If you let it go too long, eventually you will do that. There was a time when I was working over there at Pactive, I, I almost got into a fight with somebody because every time he came up to me, I was like, don't talk to me like that, man. I'll hit you, you know? And I was like, oh, man, why would I say that? It's like the old nature, you know what I mean? It's hard to... And then it's like, oh, well, I could defend my sin. Before you know it, you're in a fight. You're in a fist fight, you know? And at the end of the day, I would go home, and I would think about it, and I'd be like, you know what? I'm really the one provoking this guy. <laughs> I'm, the bull I'm like the, the one fueling this thing. That's how deceived I am. I had to repent and get delivered. Because I hadn't been in the workplace for a while, you know, and I was like kind of in my own Christian world, and now I'm dealing with people from the world again. And like you're, you're placed under a new pressure. You're placed under a new stress that you need to, it's like lifting weights. If you're not used to lifting that kind of weight and you go to bench press 300 pounds, you're going to tear your pec and break your shoulder, you know. But if you're used to dealing with it, you, you'll be able to deal with it. It's the same thing with everything. I was talking to one good brother the other day, and he told me, Chris, I don't sin, you know, because I came out of the world, and I live an isolated life, so I got it down pretty good, so I'm walking pretty good. And I told him, that's good, brother, I'm, I'm hearing that, but if you were in a spot where you were being provoked, like Jesus Christ, you would learn real quick that you're going to sin. Because it's not easy not to sin when you're in a tough spot, when someone's provoking you. You know what I mean? You see, with me, when I was at that job, someone was just giving me a dirty look. Like I was saying before. And all I had to do was say, whatever, he's giving me a dirty look. But I would drive up to him on my forklift and say, don't look at me like that. I didn't need to do that. That's why I feel like I provoked the situation. I had to repent. Now, if someone gives me a dirty look, I'll be like, the guy's, the guy's in bondage. 
I feel bad for him. Be like, hey man, can I pray for you? Like that. But that wasn't the old me, and that's not the human nature. The human nature is to try and like, if someone doesn't like you, you don't like them. It's just the way the devil does it. Next. Get rid of people that demons work through. So I was talking before about people who are demonized that are going to come in here and try and drive wedges into the church. We're going to watch them, and then we're going to get rid of them. That results getting rid of them. If they're causing an outright problem, we're going to get rid of them right away. If uh, someone is usurping authority, where the authority structure of the church is suffering immediate attack and breakdown from a usurper or something, they need to go immediately that same day. But uh, the gossipers are the ones that we're going to watch. You know, the ones that aren't blatantly saying, I'm not going to listen to you. But then they'll go around somewhere else and say, oh, I don't like the way he does this or that, or I don't like the way Brother James does this, or Aaron doesn't uh, show enough love in the church, and they don't approach them, but they go telling other people. They'll go tell everyone but the person they keep talking about. That's because they're trying to move the people against that person. And people have all different kinds of agendas. The Jezebel is always going to move the people against the pastor or the leader. Jezebel always comes in to decapitate the headship and divide it that way. Because they know all they got to do is put stress on the, on the headship and, get, and provoke him to sin. And then they plan on going around and going and telling everybody what he did. And the worst devil that exists on this earth is the provoking devil. The one that prods and pokes and prods and pokes and waits for a person to not be perfect. And then they go out and spread the news all over the world. Those are the worst kind of devils. That's what they did to Jesus Christ. They went in filled with demons knowing they had a plan to destroy him, to character assassinate him to make him look like he thought he was God, all that. That's why they asked him all those tricky questions, to see if they could catch him in his words all the time. Because they're provokers, and they're subtly trying to come in and destroy. The next thing demons hate is silence. A lot of people go to pray, but they're talking immediately. They're kneeling down, they're running their mouth. They're not listening to God. When we come to God in prayer, we need to come before Him in reverence. One thing I've started to do, even though my knees are bad and my back's bad, I started to kneel down at night sometimes. The demons hate that. The demons don't like when you just humble yourself before God in private, not before men. You'll see people doing it in churches. One time we were up in that church in, uh, up there where, uh, in, where, uh, near Wyoming or where, wherever it was. And there was one guy in there doing that in the church. And I was looking at him. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This guy was on the, on the rug, kneeling down, weeping before God, crying, making a big scene, hooting and hollering. Everyone else is kind of just sitting there worshiping, just being normal. And this just didn't look normal. You always know when someone's a fake when it don't fit, when you get that check in your spirit like oh this is weird you know why is this guy got to go oh lord oh like he's weeping and groaning and all this stuff you know they caught the guy masturbating two weeks later it almost split the church it did it did mess up a lot of the church that was the guy I couldn't believe it because I remembered the guy when they told I had left by then. And two weeks later or something, I got a call that that guy was masturbating. And I was like, don't surprise me in the least. Because it's always the guy that's got to show off in church that he's so holy. That's the biggest disgusting devil in the whole church. It's always the guy that won't stop speaking in tongues. That's a pervert. Comes into the church. Blah, 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 blah. I'm so spiritual. Blah, 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 blah. And that's the guy that's always in the sin. You can tell when someone's showing off gifts. 
You know when they come into play at a weird time, everyone's sitting and eating a sandwich, and some guy's like, I just got a word from the Holy Spirit. And everyone's like, well, can we finish lunch first? Because everyone's eating now. We don't need a word right now. Everything's good. You know people give a word when everything's going good? There's no drama. No, nothing's going on. Everyone's just talking to their kids or eating some cake. The Lord told me you're going to be a prophet. Shut up. Shut up. Some people just can't. They, they're not comfortable in their own skin. Because they're insecure, they're filled with demons, they have anxiety. We don't always need, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now, in the heat of a moment where someone's seeking help, if someone's got a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a prophetic word, fine. But we're going to know the difference over here. I'll tell you that right now. We are going to know the difference. The next, thing's de the next thing demons don't like they don't like love, they don't like rest, they don't like peace, they don't like patience, and most of all, out of those, they don't like gratitude, because they're always trying to get you to be ungrateful. All the ones I read before that, you all understand, but gratitude, you need to understand how to put gratitude into play in your life. The second the devil's got you saying, oh, woe is me. My kid is sick, this or that, I'm sick. You immediately got to look at somebody else's situation and know somebody else has got it worse than you. And then you got to start thinking about all the good things that you do have. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes my kids are running around the house and tearing the place to shreds and all four of them are screaming at once. And I'm like, oh man, I got to deal with this. And then... I get convicted, and then I'm like, some people can't even have kids. There's some people that call this ministry, some people who I love dearly, who they want kids so bad, and they, you know, it's not that time for them. God's, God's not allowing it right now for, for whatever purpose. And I think about it, and it helps me be like, well, I'm grateful my kids are running around the house screaming. Because there's always a negative way to look at something, and there's always a positive way to look at that same thing. At all times. There's nothing so bad that you can't find po the positive side of it. Nothing. Nothing. Disease, divorce, death, nothing. All things work to the good of those who love God and live their life according to His purpose. So you immediately have to search for that, and that will get a lot of demons out of your life, just doing that. The next thing they hate is when people honor their parents. Now, this is hard. Some parents make it very hard. But when you honor your parents, you'll be blessed. When you disrespect your parents, you'll be cursed. Um, when I came to Christ, my parents gave me a big headache. They didn't do the right thing to support my faith. And I got mad at them, and I started fighting with them, and I started saying, I'm doing the right thing, you're doing the wrong thing, and you said you would be happy if I stopped uh, messing around with drugs. Why are you now, you know? And now I'm fighting with them and disrespecting them as a Christian. Um, that's a hard time for people, and I understand that. But you need to make sure you reconcile with them, and you, like I said before, seek peace with all men, because the Bible's clear. It's one, of the, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's a foundational thing that God always looked at, right? Um, we got to watch out for it, you know? Even when your parents are frustrating or annoying, be sure to honor them, respect them, even if they're drinking or drugging or whatever, you know, or, or provoking you, you know? I know the Bible says parents shouldn't provoke their children. Some do. When you're a child and you're a Christian, or when you're even a grown adult with parents that are provoking you and you're a Christian, you need to overlook it and respect them anyway. And don't, don't lash back at them. Next is to remain calm through your demonic attacks. Back to what I was saying. They like when you're in fear. They like when you're in torment. Panic is their favorite. 
extreme panic where you're having a panic attack and anxiety, they will not go anywhere if you're anxious, if you're having panic attacks, if you don't know how to control your breath, you will never get rid of them. Never. The breath is one of the most important keys to getting rid of demons. However, you won't be able to start applying the techniques to bring your breath down and control you and slow down your breath until you get all willful sin out of your life and you grow in God and you start to really get discernment to understand when you're not at rest. You need that discernment first to start controlling your breath. Once you get that discernment, you learn to control your breath. Now you're always in obedience almost. It's much harder for them to bring you out of obedience when you're always minding your breath in, in obedience to God. Because when someone punches you or hits you with a car, you're going to notice real quick, the second you go, <gasps> when you're controlling your breath, you're going to know, oh, no. Because that just brought you out of your the way you're maintaining your breath. Anytime you're sighing, gasping, someone does something wrong to you and you're like, like that, or, you know, you're just anything. Any kind of uh, tense breathing. That's, that's a devil in there trying to, trying to manifest itself and it's coming up and it's going to put all its strength into getting you angry in that moment. And that's where you need to resist it. The best time to resist a devil is the time that it's pouncing on you. That's when you need to get it because it's not going to leave until it knows that you can resist it in the height of its efforts. Does that make sense? You have to resist it in the height of its efforts or it will not leave. It's like I say, it's like the guy who's trying to get the woman, right? He'll tell her, oh, let me bring you out to a nice restaurant. She'll say no. He'll show up to her house with flowers. She'll say no. He'll do all kinds of things. He'll send boxes of chocolates to her work. She'll say no. And he keeps doing, he keeps doing, trying different things. But the second that he tries everything, when he shows up there with a diamond necklace and he gives it all he's got and the best, you know, the best lines he's got, shows up at her house, sings her a song, and has the diamond necklace out, and she says no, he's like, I got nothing else. I got nothing else to try. I'm out of here. I'm done. That's how demons are. They, they, give, they won't leave until they've exhausted all of their best efforts against you and failed. It's exactly the same thing. So you need to make sure you get them in that moment where they're, where they're attacking you. Right when someone provokes you is when you're going to need to resist them. For me, for anger, until someone provoked me as bad as it could be, you know, where I'm telling them to be quiet, and they're saying, I'm going to be quiet, blah, 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 in your face like a lunatic, and you just say, no, I'm not going to do it, I'm walking away. That's when I got delivered of anger. Because, and as you're fighting it, that provoking will ramp up to a heightened level as you're fighting it. Because when Satan sees that you're about to overcome that sin, he's going to make those demons do everything they can to get you. And when you fought it long enough, the devil's going to be before the throne of God and God's going to say, no, you've, you've exhausted everything. I'm, I'm done letting you. Anything else is just not fair. You're, you've tested them. They overcame it. Now leave them alone. Same thing like Job, like that, right? So, demons also hate when you ask God for help. They don't want you to turn to God. They want you to always try and do it yourself. They want you to always try and figure it out yourself. And when you're not getting breakthrough, you have to immediately turn to God in prayer. It's very, very important, okay? Because he's going to show you the way out of the problem if you don't know the way out of the problem. And they don't want you to fulfill your calling. So if you fulfill your calling, a certain class of demon is going to leave your body. So that's very important also. So that's all I have for today. 
If anyone has any questions about it, you could ask me about it. If anyone uh, that watches this sermon online has questions about it, you could ask me about it. So, Father, we ask that you give everyone the strength to resist these devils. I know it's not easy. They fight hard. They're, they have power to tempt. They have power to deceive. And we ask that you give us the wisdom and the strength and the discernment to understand it and overcome it by the blood of your Son. We thank you that you sent your Son here to cast out devils. We thank you that you've given us that authority to cast out devils. We rejoice that our names are written in the book of life, and we love you, Father, forever and ever. Amen.